so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to Christian and Donald for having me in this uh, event and also for the kind introduction. I'm really glad that after a long time we managed to align our calendars and I could join you today. A bit about myself because it's the first time I'm speaking in this forum. I've been working with IPv6 for over 11 years. First time in Cisco as a systems engineer, where it was kind of a um, sidekick for me. And then um, I actually in 2016 joined Microsoft Enterprise Network Group as an IPv6 network architect. And I worked on an initiative which was preparing all network services eventually for IPv6 only. In 2014, I founded the UK IPv6 Council, which Christian and Don already mentioned. Um, it's a technology user group, free membership. You just simply join us on LinkedIn if you want to get some updates from us, or you can just check out our website at www.ipv6.org.uk. Our group has almost 700 members, and we are actually going strong. Um, we can also see that the IPv6 deployments in the UK are growing, which is uh, great, and that's really what we want to see. But today, I'm not uh, here to speak to tell you about the work of the council or to talk about the intricacies of IPv6 as a technology. I'm here really just as an IPv6 practitioner and I want to share some experience and bring to your attention a kind of a different side of IPv6. It's the human side which is really causing this technology to have awfully hard time and even though technically it's completely uh, logical and we really need it to support the growth of the internet services and of businesses uh, without constantly growing the complexity, it's just simply so much hard work. I would just say that this talk has been inspired by Jen Linkova from Google. I'm sure you guys uh, know Jen because I believe she spoke in this forum in the past. She also presented uh, about the common IPv6 mixed conceptions at our annual meeting in December 2018. Her talk is recorded and then she published a blog on RIPE uh, RIP NCC uh, website. And this actually really made me think about the importance of human side of deploying any technology, not just IPv6, or something that I kind of call the psychology of deploying um, IPv6 or any technology. Because really, if this was a purely technical problem, uh, we would not be looking at this type of graph. We would be looking at uh, uh, the curve that would, that would be much steeper, uh, that would be a simple line, not an oscillating one. You can see that um, in, in the time before we entered into the weird current situation, uh, the difference between weeks and uh, weekdays and weekends was about 5%. Today we are looking at about 2.5%. That's basically because more people are working from home. But what it really says is that people at home have IPv6, but when they go to work, they don't have it. So um, I assume that we already know that IPv6 is not easy. It's another thing that we have to learn and we know how many things we have to learn as the technology people. Uh, we also, of course, we need to invest time and understand it and it does require effort and feature support in infrastructure and applications. Well, that is already there. We are in 2020 after all. Uh, we are very uh, far behind the early adopters point on the adoption curve of IPv6. So what is really causing this slow progress and the widening gap when the technology is ready? In general, I have observed over the years that we as, engineer, we, uh, as engineers, we are not always people's people, right? We like to tinker with technology, to work with technology, because we kind of like to avoid the difficult human interactions, right? Um, well, that's bad news. If you work with IPv6 or you really want to get on with deploying it, you are set to encounter and deal with a lot of people because this is, isn't always an easy sell. So what kind of people have I met uh, along the way over the years? I can tell you all different kinds and that's what you can also expect. And here I'm really sharing just my own experience. I created some categories, you can create your own. I'm sure you could, you could think of some others. Uh, please feel free to share them in the Slack channel. We probably all like to uh, have a laugh. Take this all in good humor. And so let's get started. What have I seen? The first one I call IPv6 haters and trolls. Because surely you know at least one or more people. Collectively, we know quite a few. And these are people 
that no matter how positive message I gave about the IPv6 project, these people would always find the smallest thing that didn't work, the tiniest detail, which was something that I generally shared to enable people to learn from my experience. And but these haters and trolls, they would basically take the story, turn it on its head, and basically always highlight the negative points, what's broken, and they would dismiss every uh, possible achievement. They would say kind of like, here you go, yet another reason why one should not attempt to deploy this IPv6. To give you an example, a while ago I wrote a blog about the IPv6 project I've been working on, and some of these clickbait sites got hold of it and they picked up on it, they wrote a story. Uh, all of a sudden I was getting emails uh, where basically the elders of the internet were condolencing me. They would say, we are so sorry your project is not going well and that it's going so badly. I was like, like what just happened? Um, because I wrote this blog, which is kind of quite optimistic. And then I found out really what happened. So all I can tell you that um, I, at the time, I just pointed the people to the original source of information. And honestly, haters and trolls will always hate and they were constantly on a mission to, uh, to kind of break you down. So you can't really stop them. But what you can do is really lock them out and just keep on working. It often turns out that they don't understand the problem enough or they really don't have enough practical experience and if you flood them with plenty of information, they really just become confused, which you can actually observe in their writing. Um, just keep going and let them hate. I assume they are very sad people, probably uh, suffering with some technology related incident in their childhood. And the funniest bit is that often they hate IPv6 from IPv4 only platforms. So that's another reason why we really shouldn't concern ourselves with them. The next group I call IPv6 deniers. These are people who I would say they live somewhere in time before 2011. Uh, they don't really realize that the world is now at over 32% of IPv6 enablement. That is at least that's based on the Google statistics. These people have been obviously sleeping for the past nine years because, or potentially even um, their entire professional career because they have actually missed both of the World IPv6 events, be it the launch, uh, be it the day in 2011, and then launch in 2012. They also have never heard of Google statistics. I already mentioned that, and you have seen the graph earlier. Uh, they kind of missed the fact that Windows, since version 7, iOS and macOS, and also Linux, prefer IPv6 only by default. So if you simply feed those devices IPv6 enabled connection and they attempt to connect to IPv6 enabled content, they will just use IPv6, uh, you know. So all of a sudden, all these people are saying, well, we've done this on the network and all of a sudden we see like 30, 40% of the user traffic is actually on IPv6, wow. Well, yeah, the devices are ready. These people, the deniers, they also actually missed the fact that Apple announced uh, in 2015 uh, that uh, since iOS 10, so they announced in 2015 but started enforcing in 2016, as of iOS 10 for the App Store, all the applications submitted have to support IPv6 only through NAT64. So that was kind of a very interesting thing because that got lots of people actually interested in IPv6. The deniers also failed to notice that the mobile data is often IPv6 only. So if you have ever heard of T-Mobile US, EE or 3 in the UK or Reliance GIO in India, you would have heard uh, that basically they are solving the shortage of IPv4 addresses on their mobile data networks with IPv6 only. They rely on functionalities which are included in the mobile phones like 464XLAT. They um, adjust their networks for that, but basically people are already accessing the internet content over IPv6 often without knowing about it. And yeah, that's the point, people really shouldn't know about IPv6, right? But when, while we are in business of deploying IPv6, we need to make sure people are aware. The good news is that these people can often be really convinced when um, I present them with data and with the facts. Um, they start changing their minds and usually this stuff comes to them as a surprise. I would say um, it's good to 
turn them into at least silent supporters uh, because often it's the quiet undercurrent uh, that's something that we need to get things going. They also help us, I would say in general, to sharpen the story, to make sure that we really get the message across uh, clearly, which then basically saves time and makes uh, more people support IPv6. The next group I call IPv6 pretenders because man, these can be a lot of work, you know. Um, they are not gonna really uh, openly fight back and say, well, I don't want to work on this. Um, they just passively resist or ignore the problem. Um, often they nod when their boss is in the room and say, yes, of course, it is very important, but please do not ask me to do any work. No, I know you've got this test environment, but please don't make me use it to actually verify that my applications truly work with IPv6. Um, they will always fall, on their fall back on their management to make the decision about IPv6 as a priority. They will repeatedly ask for a business case. Why should they really prioritize their work? Even though I have already given them the business case about five times. Or these are people, um, if not in your company, you can meet them at different conferences who very uh, firmly say on the mic, uh, thou shall deploy IPv6, you bad ISP, how come you have not done it yet? But if you actually ask them, like, what have you done in your own company, in your own environment? Like, oh no, please, it's too difficult for our organization. We don't have time to do this, you know, and it's too hard. Well, we you know this is not easy, as I already said, uh, but then these people should really stop giving hard time to others if their actions really don't support their words. So how do you really deal with them? If you or someone else in your organization can really make them care and set it as one of their priorities, um, so, and make it that if they don't do their bit, they would actually block the entire uh, IPv6 deployment. Usually the high level management um, can help with that. They can level up the playing field um, or the industry actually helps, you know, point them out to the industry. Like if we don't get this going, um, our apps, which are revenue generating, could potentially be removed from the app store. That's not, good. That's not a good thing. Also, these people really like milestones and roadmaps. So I used to say to my team, well, they want a deadline. We are going to give them a deadline. And that usually really worked. Group number four, so-called IPv6 debaters. These are people who will endlessly discuss various options. Yeah, they would deem each and every one insufficient in delivering the perfect solution. Uh, you know, I have to think back to the times like endless hours in meetings where nothing would be decided. They were just totally pointless and we would be going in circles. And at the end, everybody just, did. the only thing everybody agreed on was that we needed yet another meeting. Um, the reason why they didn't decide was because none of the solutions that was proposed was perfect. And of course, like my advice here is like, we need to iterate or you need to iterate. Choose the smallest deliverable and work from that. Uh, then show them the result and build on that because um, the result usually speaks for themselves. I know that these people really don't like it. They don't like to iterate. They prefer the perfect thing. They like the big bang approach. But this in the end prevents them from really doing anything. Um, I would remind them that uh, an open mind really achieves the most. Uh, just choose one option and accept that the world is not a theoretical kingdom, but it is a brown field which um, is burdened with the technical depth of the past and the decisions that we had to make about future without really knowing what the future is going to look like, right? That is the reality that uh, the one correct choice is really always determined by the state of your network, your infrastructure, your applications. Uh, what are you really trying to achieve? Are you focusing on the external facing customers, on the internal employees? What is really supportable with the current generation of hardware you have? And what is actually politically acceptable in your own organization? There's one great company uh, these days who basically says code wins arguments. I would tweak that saying and say that an IPv6 enabled network segment wins arguments. So my recommendation often is like, if you really are so good at debating, please do join the mailing list of the IETF. Because if you guys have been exposed to a one of them, you know how much people like to talk there, you know. And also I would say the, the plus side of these people is that 
they actually can be your best pilot users because they will not forgive a single thing, you know. They will provide very detailed feedback. So if you can take that potential and turn it into your advantage, you know, engage them in a certain way, they actually might become supporters without even knowing about it. The type number five, and I would say now we are moving more in, into the more positive um, space. Uh, I call them IPv6 enthusiasts. These are people who really understand that IPv6 is important and they really take opportunity to live in the new world. They participate in pilots and actually they don't often need to be network engineers or technology people, you know, by their job or like application developers, etc. They can be your project managers or uh, program managers or, uh, you know, a group from marketing which understands, yeah, things are changing and if the IPv4 world you don't even know what it is but if that is broken we need to move to the new thing these are awesome because they really make us enjoy the work and they make it worthwhile um, they also take the opportunities as i said participate in pilots they can provide feedback they come up with ideas that we as technologists probably would have never thought of they can translate our technical messaging to other users who are not technical they can translate it and explain things in their own words which is awesome because in the end, we just need everybody to kind of join in and um, participate in particular pilots, deployments, etc. because in the end, you can have a lovely network and if you don't have users on it, it's kind of pointless, right? So um, they, they, it's really worth, uh, worthwhile uh, investing in these people and getting their feedback as much as possible. The final type of personality, I call them, I PV6 heroes. So these are people who actually started working on IPv6 in mid 90s, you know, or maybe even later, you know, they joined in. These are people who organized the World IPv6 Day and World IPv6 launch because they said, hey, people are really good when it comes to deadlines, you know, and milestones. So let's set up a couple of milestones because they drive certain behavior. And they were quite right because lots of large organizations and small organizations took notice and they just wanted to do their bit to participate and see what that new IPv6 world looks like. These people have spent endless hours, days, months, years um, um, tirelessly educating others, harassing vendors, asking for feature support, being like introducing features through standards or being in those meeting vendors and saying like, if you don't support feature X, Y, Z, we will not buy your product. They also went out of their way, possibly often outside their immediate job uh, remit and they convinced the management that this is the right thing to do. And in some cases they were then told, well, okay, go ahead and just be the best, uh, which is great because then they actually really uh, got the buy-in from their management. These people would also always ask in those vendor meetings or internal meetings when you are talking about new designs of network applications, etc. And what about IPv6? Does it support IPv6? Can we enable the IPv6 from the beginning? They, in my opinion, moved us all forward and they really battled years of resistance, right? We can see it, uh, the different uh, adoption levels in different countries. I'd say that these people who, in my opinion, are the superwoman, uh, supermen and superwomen, they got us to what's today 32% of global adoption of IPv6. So you can think of them that way. I'm sure that you probably know one or two of such people. And I would say maybe they wouldn't think of themselves as superman or superwoman, but they definitely share certain characteristics. And to put it in a, in a sentence which is so popular in one particular movie, these are simply people of focus, commitment, and sheer will, because that's definitely one thing that you need with IPv6, and that's persistence. So what about us, you know, the IPv6 practitioners that we are here, so, and we don't, we are, don't feel, definitely don't fall into that, those negative groups, so we are probably far beyond those like enthusiasts, and we are probably aspiring to be the heroes. Well, I would say we are the jacks of all trades, really. Um, IP is on everything, so be ready when you're working on IPv6 project that the breadth that you have to go into versus depth is just 
just off the chart. Like you might be a network engineer, but you have to deal with application developers and you know that application networks, like people don't really speak always the same language, but you have to deal with that. You have to engage with management, end users, vendors. So your communication skills is absolute key, uh, um, are, are absolute key. And if you are not comfortable with that, make sure you get a good program manager or somebody architect who can actually articulate all of this and uh, be that interface. We also have to do the hard heavy lifting of encouraging vendors. And I say encouraging, sometimes that means having tough conversation. Make sure you have a buy-in from your management and they are backing you up. When you tell the vendor that, well, if you're not going to support it, then maybe we are going to look at a vendor Y, right? Um, and if you think, well, this all sounds like really hard work. I'm not sure I've got the skills. Uh, I can tell you that somebody, that there's somebody who should do it that somebody is off indefinitely and you really need to do it. And if you thought about this problem and you thought maybe this would be a good thing, but somebody else should do it, well, no, you are the right person to pick this up and do it. So now it's really your turn. I would like to conclude this talk really with uh, why IPv6, um, because you might say, okay, these are the people types and you kind of need them whenever you talk about deploying some new technology or looking into a new problem. But now let's focus on why IPv6. Um, why should you really care? You must say, oh, it's not really applicable to us. We are very happy living behind NAT, yeah. Um, but all of a sudden these cloud providers are starting to support IPv6. There is something going on. Well, um, you can't get any more IPv4 addresses for free, right? The uh, RIR runout is real, are started in 2015 then it just simply con the snowballing, right? Um, Upnik, we know that RIPE uh, run out in November this year. The other uh, RIRs are basically going to run out uh, probably during this calendar year. So you can't really go and get even your last slash 22. Um, so your other option is to go and buy. Well, that is starting to be a very expensive shopping trip if you um, accept my language because I have been following this for years. So the price started at about $7 per IP address in slash 16, and that was pre-ARIN run out. So that was uh, early 2015. Since ARIN has run out, the price is just simply growing. And I can assure you, we have not hit the ceiling yet. Um, so here, just for comparison, I've got some data from IPv4 Market Group, which are fantastic at sharing the information publicly. Um, they uh, facilitate IPv4 uh, address space transfers. So as you can see, uh, what started at $7 in tw early 2015, by August 2017, we were already looking at at least $14.50 per IP address. And today, if you look at it, we are, this is a figure I got off the website um, yesterday, we are already looking at $21 per IP address. So if you need a significant number of IPv4 addresses, public IPv4 addresses, you are looking at spending quite a lot of money. And who, who likes to deal with your financial department or with your accountants justifying your budget? I don't think we like that. So it's better to deploy IPv6. And even if that is not a problem for you and you don't care, um, I can just tell you that the internet is changing and you really can't stop it. Um, already mentioned mobile providers, but there are wireline providers as well, like uh, Charter Communications. I know Comcast were trying something free in France, Reliance in, um, in India, SoftBank in Japan, and many more. They are basically all working, I should also say Sky, uh, because uh, they are launching a service provider in Italy and they're actually going to V6 only there very soon. Um, IPv4 over IPv6 only internet is becoming uh, a reality. And really, if you want to maintain good user experience for your external customers, but also for your internal users, your employees, the best defense is to deploy IPv6. To conclude, I hope that this brief talk um, showed you the other side of IPv6, that it is very human, not just technical, because we all work with people. Remember all these six types and make allies um, and just don't be afraid to go really broad. Uh, successful deployment truly requires both engineering and political angles because I have not seen a single IPv6 project which would be successful if, it, if when it was only bottom up, right? Is the engineer's story was a good thing? Well, I can tell you that your, both, your managers will very quickly reprioritize you and say, you 
you're not spending time on that, you're not spending money on that, we need you to focus on something that is actually delivering us immediate money, right? But we need V6 to stay connected and have a good connectivity on the internet. And yeah, please, uh, just keep in mind, there is no better time to start now. As I said, we are beyond that early adopters point on the adoption curve, right? There's a good support of IPv6 in, uh, in network infrastructure, uh, you, when you go to like cloud solutions, like cloud security, et cetera, that's still kind of lagging behind, but that's the same thing what the guys from Google said. You need to go and have those discussions, ask for it, have the engagement with the vendors because the vendors are saying, oh, customers are not really asking for IPv6 support. So we are kind of in this like H22, um, you know, chicken and egg scenario. And I think we are mature enough as IPv6 practitioners that we can go out there and have those conversations. Um, I would also say, based on my experience from, from Microsoft, is like, if you think that V6 works on dual stack network, try switching off IPv4 in the network. And you will see, and you will uncover bugs in software, be it in the device OS, be it in the network infrastructure, where all of a sudden these things are not working, they are broken. But you can't really see them on dual stack because IPv4 keeps everybody connected. So if you really want to make sure that your v6 works, uh, work on IPv6 only segments and deployments. And I would like to also invite everybody to write NCC Educa IPv6 only event, which is happening in a couple of days. Uh, the event is for free and that is actually really focused on IPv6 only and what would it take to switch off IPv4. That's all for me for now.